welcome to the talk. Uh, we'll do an intro and a deep dive into what Rook is. Uh, but basically, Rook is a Kubernetes storage platform. Uh, I am Travis Nielsen. I'm from Red Hat. My colleague Saturu uh, from Saibusu will also be talking with us. But today, I want to talk about, first of all, what are Kubernetes storage challenges that everyone has. Then let's get into what is Rook, what is Ceph, how they work together. And then we'll get into some features. You know, what features are have all has Rook always had, and what features are in our latest release 1.8. So Turo will then show a demo of what it's like to use Rook, and at the end we'll be happy to take your questions. So during this presentation, you can type your questions uh, in the chat, or you can save them to the end. So what are your Kubernetes storage challenges? Everyone who has Kubernetes really needs to have applications that store things. Kubernetes is a, is a platform to manage distributed applications. Now, these applications are traditionally stateless, or they don't need to store anything. So you're relying on some external storage to serve what's backing your, your applications. So these applications, if they have storage that's outside Kubernetes, it's difficult to make them portable. It's a, it's a burden to deploy because the storage may be different everywhere you deploy. And then at the end of the day, who is managing the storage? Do you rely on a cloud provider that manages this, manages that storage? And if so, you, know, you may run into vendor lock-in challenges where you don't want to be tied to any particular storage platform. So here's where Rook came in. We, we were looking at Kubernetes and we thought, Hey, how do we bring storage to Kubernetes in a way that's natively built into Kubernetes and works well with Kubernetes? So Rook, it creates and provides a data platform inside your same Kubernetes cluster where you're running other applications. You will then consume the Rook storage just like any other storage using storage classes and PVCs. The way Rook is implemented is with an operator Kubernetes operator and custom resource definitions. So using the custom resource definitions, you can tell Rook how you want the storage configured. But at the end of the day, the power that Rook provides is automating the storage platform, deploying it for you, configuring it for you, managing upgrades for you, so you don't have to know all the details of how the storage platform works. Now, Rook is open source. It's uh, based on Apache 2.0 uh, license. So it's very flexible to allow you to deploy in your environments. I just want to stop for a moment and say happy fifth birthday to Rook. Uh, in KubeCon Seattle, uh, five years ago, we first went public and open sourced Rook. We're just excited for all of the community support and the growth that we've had over the past five years to help it be production ready and deployed in many production environments. So let's get into what is Ceph. So Ceph is a storage is the storage platform that Rook deploys. Ceph is also open source, and it provides three types of storage. It provides block storage, shared file system, and object, which is S3 compliant. Ceph favors data consistency, so you never have to worry about if your data is safe. And Ceph has been around for almost 10 years now in, in production environments. It was first released in July of 2012. And you can refer to the website, ceph.io, for more information. So architecturally, Rook really uh, has three layers to consider. So that the top layer, Rook owns the management layer. So we Rook deploys the operator and manages the storage platform. Rook deploys a CSI driver. So the Ceph CSI driver now is the second layer. That CSI driver dynamically provisions and then mounts the storage to your application pods. And then the third layer is Ceph. So Ceph is the actual data layer. Anytime your pod is reading and writing data to the cluster, it will go directly to Ceph for that storage. And Rook is not involved in the data layer. Rook is really only the management layer. So I've got some diagrams now that will help us see these different layers and how they're separated in a few different ways. So first, the Rook management layer. 
So Rook owns the deployment of, of all of the, the pods and the services and the endpoints and all of the resources to make up the Ceph cluster to provide that data platform. So this is a diagram of pods that might be running on three different nodes. So the pods in blue are the Rook pods, so the Rook operator and the Rook discovery daemon. So they provide management. The green pods then are the CSI driver, the CSI driver, the CSI provisioner, the RBD plugin, which is for block storage, and the CephFS plugin, which is for the shared file system storage. And then each of the red pods is a Ceph daemon. So the Ceph pods are the ones that actually provide that data layer. And there are a number of different daemons that Ceph provides in that, in that data layer. The MONs and OSDs, the manager, and so on. So we won't get into exactly what all of those Ceph daemons are, but so here we see that Rook is really managing the deployment of these pods and deciding how to configure the Ceph daemons. So at the second layer, so if we look at after Rook and Ceph are deployed, now how do you attach your storage, your application pods to consume that storage? Right? You need to first provision that storage. So the CSI driver will take your application and your application has a volume claim or a PVC that uh, that PVC will consume the storage from a storage class, which is a Ceph RBD for a block storage or CephFS storage class for shared storage. The CSI driver will provision the storage either for that block or that file system storage. Now on the right hand side with these purple uh, boxes, we see this is with an object storage. So an S3 interface provides access to object storage. And we provision that in a similar pattern to PVCs with what we call a bucket claim. So a, a, an object bucket is of course something that's backing, the storage is backing an S3 endpoint. And that endpoint comes from a storage class which declares where in Ceph uh, to configure that storage. Now at the third layer, after the data, the storage is already provisioned, how does the application write to the, 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 the data layer? So Ceph has a driver that after it's mounted, this RBD kernel driver for block storage, it will write to the Ceph cluster. If you have a shared file system, the CephFS kernel driver will write to the Ceph cluster and it will manage the communication between all of those different Ceph pods. Or if you have an S3 client, the S3 client will connect to the Ceph RDW daemon to read and write that object storage right to the buckets. So you'll see that in this diagram, when your applications are reading and writing data, Rook is not directly in this path. Rook is only in the management layer when you set up or provision the storage. Let's get into some of the key features that Rook has, has always had or had for a long time from the start. So first of all, Ceph, deploying Ceph is simple with Rook. We've tried to make it as easy as we can. That was one of the goals of the Rook project from the start. We provide several manifests for installing Ceph in a default configuration. And you can change those settings for more complex configurations. But at the end of the day, you know, we've made Ceph simple to install. Here we show several kubectl commands of what you need to create if you're creating these manifests directly. And we also have two Helm charts that will help you install the operator and create the Ceph cluster as well. We have a CSI driver. The CSI driver, as a, has already been mentioned, it dynamically provisions the file and block storage. It allows you to expand volumes. It will. It also implements snapshots and cloning, so you can have some of the backup functionality. All right. So, what environments can you run Rook in? Well, Rook primarily is run uh, in production environments in two types. You have bare metal environments where you have your own hardware your, or your own env virtual environments, and you get to install Rook. This is, the, this is the main scenario where we expected Rook to be used, where there is no cloud provider storage that you can uh, back your storage with and back your applications with. 
Um, so the second environment though, that is commonly run is in cloud providers, where even though cloud providers have storage that you can build on, Rook has several benefits with Ceph that overcome some limitations that cloud providers have. So in that cloud environment, what Rook does is it allows you to have storage that spans availability zones. You can have faster failover times where it's seconds instead of minutes for your pods to, uh, to fail over. You can have a greater number of PVs per node, as many as 30. You can use storage with better performance to cost ratio. And also, Rook really gives you a consistent platform no matter where you're installing, whether you're deploying in AWS or Azure or Google Cloud or, or any environment. Uh, this is, it's a consistent storage platform everywhere. When you're running in these cloud environments, Ceph will use PVCs as the underlying storage. So you can connect Ceph to the underlying storage platform in a consistent way with your other Kubernetes applications as well. No, there's no need for direct access to local devices when you're running in the cloud or mount them in advance. It's all dynamically provisioned. Another aspect of Rook is uh, you can configure it for any cluster topology, whether you have just a, a flat level of nodes. Um, Ceph will divide the storage across the, the nodes in an available way to keep the data highly available and durable. Or if you have multiple racks or zones or any other complex topology, Ceph and Rook will work well in those environments to spread your data across the appropriate data zones so that you can rely on your data being spread across failure domains. All right now when it's time to update Rook or Ceph, uh, there's a way where Rook handles everything. You tell Rook what version you want to run and Rook will upgrade all of the Rook, the yeah, Rook operator and the Rook daemon. Rook will also update the Ceph daemons, all of the mons and OSDs in a rolling fashion so that your storage will remain active and available and online during the upgrades as well. Another feature Rook has is, let's say you already have a Ceph cluster running outside of Kubernetes. So using the CSI driver and the Rook operator, uh, Rook makes it simple to connect your CSI driver to that external Ceph cluster. No need to run Ceph cluster inside Kubernetes if you if you want to run and connect to your existing set cluster. Now, if you want to have access to object storage with an S3 endpoint, you can provision object buckets. So this is done with an object bucket claim. This is a very similar pattern to using a PVC where Rook will create a bucket when requested, give that application access to the bucket with a secret, and then uh, you can have you know, provision your buckets dynamically. This is very similar to the new container object storage interface or Kazi, which is coming soon, and we will be implementing that in Rook as well when Kazi is available. So let's talk about some Rook 1.8 features that are in their latest release. What Rook 1.8 is was just released as of KubeCon. We're expecting to have it out this just a few days before KubeCon China. So some of the features we have there, first, object bucket notifications. Notifications can be sent to uh, a configurable endpoint where the notifications can be based on a put or a get or a copy or a delete of different actions to the S3 store. You can specify filters for those notifications, whether it's object names, suffixes, uh, or regular expressions, or you can filter on the metadata of those objects. And you can, can send it to an endpoint such as HTTP, Kafka, or AMQP. Another feature, disaster recovery for applications. The DR is very important where applications need to span across clusters, now across Kubernetes clusters. Let's say you have a whole site go down. Your application needs to continue running in the other site. So the Ceph CSI driver supports mirroring the data with Ceph across the clusters and we provide tools and documentation to support your applications in that failover. A couple of network enhancements in the latest release. So encrypted connections across the wire. 
where you know any data that's transferred across the wire will be encrypted with Ceph's uh, Cephex encryption at rest was already has already been available for a number of releases. You can also compress the data across the network to reduce that uh, that throughput that's required across across the wire if you have compressible data. This does require an experimental version of Ceph, Ceph Quincy, which will be coming out in early 2022. Multis networking. The Multis is a, a network plugin that provides more flexibility for uh, different connections. So Rook will fully support Multis in 1.8. The CSI driver primarily needed an update to require that Multis support. Uh, a little tool that we've released is the crew a crew plugin. So perhaps you've seen other crew plugins. Really, it's for making kubectl commands uh, extend, extendable. So for example, you can say kubectl rook ceph, ceph status, and you'll see the ceph status as if you're running in the rook toolbox. But it's it's much simpler and shorter to type out. So that's just a convenience tool, but we are really excited about it. Uh, in 1.8, uh, a few important notes. If you're already a Rook user and and are considering upgrading to 1.8, we do require Kubernetes 1.16 or newer. Older versions are not supported due to old CRD versions. The Ceph versions supported are Octopus and Pacific, with Quincy as experimental coming out early next year. But the support for Ceph Nautilus was removed. And finally, if you've been using Rook for a really long time before the CSI driver, the Flex driver support is, was removed in 1.8. And we'll, we have a tool that will help you convert your volumes to CSI. And now we turn the time over to Sotiro for a demo. I have a demo to create a simple Safe cluster. Uh, I'll use JS2 softwares. There are two types of RookSafe clusters. The first one is host-based cluster, and the second one is PBC-based cluster. Host-based cluster is suitable for simple cluster, especially if uh, you use uh, all nodes and all devices for a RookSafe cluster. But safe cluster cluster resources get complicated if not all nodes and devices are used. At worst, you should uh, list all nodes and all devices for uh, clusters, used for clusters. As for PVC-based cluster, you are free from describing hardware configurations like this. And then you should, uh, you should specify only two fields the count field and the volume claim template field. Count field means the number of OSDs, and the volume claim template field is used for a template or PVC um, used for OSDs. PVC based cluster is very easy to expand. You just need to increase the count field. If you increase this field from one to two, the number of OSD is also increased to two. So let's create a, a simple PVC based cluster. I use uh, uh, one Kubernetes cluster uh, consists of uh, one node. This node has uh, two local empty block devices and the corresponding persistent volume. This demo uh, consists of three steps, and you can get the all script and the all manifest from uh, this project. So let's create a rook safe uh, rook operator as a step one. So kube control apply hardware and uh, operator.yaml. So the operator is created. Oh, 
operator is created on the uh, rook safe cluster, uh, rook safe namespace, get port k the rook safe operator cross uh, operator port is already already running. So the second step is create a uh, rook safe cluster. The manifest is on in the cluster on pbc.yaml. Yes, it's a safe cluster, cluster uh, custom resource. And it means the number of monitor port is one and the number of OST is also one. So let's apply this manifest. Mm, right. If there. No, 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 no. Press the K. Okay. So let's see the progress of creating this, <coughs> creating root safe cluster. Get port. So root safe operator is already exist, and the G's port, uh, uh, G's port uh, for um, safe CSI drivers. And now safe monitor port is running. And the second and the next step is create a manager port. And the third step is rooks, uh, creating root safe operate uh rooks OSD rook safe OSD prepare port. It's to initialize the <coughs> initialize the uh, data structure on top of uh, local block device. And the last uh, rook safe OSD port is created. It's to manage OSD ports. So rook safe get PVC. Okay. So this uh, this um, past and volume claim is created by rook and it's bound to local OSD to <clears throat> to patch and volume. Uh, it's the it's corresponding to <clears throat> uh, one of the uh, local OSD, and this PVC is consumed by this OSD port. So let's confirm the status of um, safe cluster rook safe tools apply ah uh, no, no no toolbox bot okay on the root save exec root save tools so save s command is to uh, to see the status of uh safe cluster Okay, the safe cluster is actually created and the, the number of monitor is one, the number of manager is one, and the, there, are, there is uh, one OSD. Okay. So the third and the last step is expand this cluster. So it's very easy, as said uh, before. Rook save. So it's by editing um, save cluster cluster resource. Okay, count one. Okay, so it means the number of OSD. So let's increase this to two. And let's confirm rook save get port okay so the next the second um rook safe prepare port will be created soon so wait for a while okay the osd prepare port is created and it's running uh, the now creating the second OSD data structure. And the now OSD port is created and running. OK. 
Okay, so let's confirm the, let's run the <clears throat> safe hyphen S again. Okay, the number of OSD, uh, <clears throat> number of OSD is now two. Okay, the, it means uh, this cluster is expanded correctly. There are advanced configurations about um, PVC based cluster. The first one is create persistent volumes for OSTs on demand. In this demo, I prepared the two, um, two persistent volumes beforehand. But uh, if you use CSI drivers with dynamic volume provisioning, you can omit this step. Uh, this work. And the second, second configuration is even OSD spreading among all nodes. To use uh, this feature, uh, you can use topology, topology spread constraint feature in Kubernetes. Uh, if you are interested in um, these configurations, please refer to this blog post. All right, thank you, Satoru, for that demo. Um, and thank you for joining us today to learn about Rook. Here's our, here are a few links to our website, our documentation. Uh, come join our Slack, ask questions. Uh, we like to build the community in, in an open way. We do take contributions. We're excited to, to have you join the community. Now we'd like to take your questions.